Welcome to Living Free in Tennessee, where we talk about building the life you choose on your terms. Today is Wednesday, February 22nd, 2024, and this is episode 868 of Living Free in Tennessee. And it's a Wednesday, so it's an interview show. And to for, for full transparency, the person who you can see smiling on the screen right now, and I have pre-recorded this uh, just due to some scheduling things, but it will be, you'll be seeing this Wednesday and I'm really excited to have Matthew, or Matt, sorry, I don't know why I called you Matthew. It's because Matthew, seriously, Matt Hundley from the Back to the Land Festival, from Homesteading for a Living. He does a nursery. Like he has a whole story of how he decided to get out of the city onto the land and build his life. And he has an awesome family and has worked hard, sometimes sacrificed pretty hard to put together what he has today. And I know you're going to be excited to hear his story. Before we do that, though, I want to thank our two sponsors of today's show. And the first sponsor is John Pugliano, John Pugliano of the Wealth Studying Podcast. That's at investablewealth.com. He's got a pretty cool podcast. So they're about 15 minutes long. And if if you're ready to start learning some financial literacy, it's a great podcast to listen to because John approaches investing and managing money the way you and I uh, approach homesteading. And that's by focusing on the long-term value and not letting the day-to-day -day crises cause you to make decisions out of fear. If you don't even know anything about investing at all, I recommend this podcast, like go check it out. It's the wealth studying, like homesteading podcast on any podcatcher or go to investablewealth.com. And there's a navigation in the upper right that you can click on. And that will take you straight to his podcast episodes. Our second sponsor of today's show is EMP Shield. Why not put a device on your home or on your camper or on anything that can help protect you against a surge in the electricity? EMP Shield has a device that does this. And the best thing about their, their device, besides the fact that it works, is if for some reason it doesn't work, they have insurance to replace your broken appliances if that happens. And that makes me live in Tennessee and we get some weather here. We get some surges here. And I have literally seen what happens when the transformer on the pole outside your house is hit by lightning if you do not have protection. EMPshield.com is where you get that. If you use the coupon code LFTN, you get $50 off. Okay, all of the camp announcements are over, and we are ready to start the discussion with Matt Hunley. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, we've talked a lot, mostly in person in the past, so it's fun to, fun to do it in this setting. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on today. And I, I think we've had you on like maybe a year ago. Yeah, I think so. Your year and a half. So we haven't caught up in quite some time. I have a lot of new listeners. So let's start with who is Matt Hundley and how did you end up in this crazy network of homesteaders in Tennessee? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll see how, how much I can make this concise because it's a it's it's a story like anybody knows their, their story to getting to being a homesteader is got some twists and turns in it. Um, so started off, the journey really started off in like many people around 2020, a little bit earlier, I guess, 2018, technically, um, prior to that, I had a background a little bit in homesteading. I was raised in the country on five acres. Um, we had kind of the token homestead, a few chickens and a garden, and, and we did get some good food from the garden and everything, but there wasn't much intention behind it. It was more like, you know, we live in the country cause it's nice. Um, and we kind of grow a little food, but it wasn't a, um, any serious amount though. My mom was early prepper. She was like gen one prepper, Y2K prepper. So I had a little bit of that influence early on. Um, but also I grew up in a part of Oregon that was all market garden farms where our topsoil is super deep. It's like five feet of black topsoil that the glaciers conveniently stole from Canada a few millennia ago and pushed down to Oregon. Um, and it's that amazing Willamette Valley growing region. So I, grew, I did get to grow up where I was working from the age of about 12 in the berry fields and working on little market garden organic farms. We had a lot of the OG uh, market gardeners that were organic, like back to the land, real hippies that went in the 70s and were kind of the first to reject pesticides and all of that. Um, and so I, I had a lot of that exposure early on working in an agricultural setting and tree farms and things. But I went away from it all, went into music. I know that background similar to yours. You, you spent a lot of time doing music. Um, and then around 2018, I bought my first homestead. It was very much on a whim. Those were in my early kind of, I was uh, experimenting with this whole new Bitcoin thing. And I made out like a bandit and by like a bandit, I mean, I put in like, I think $800 and I made, no, I put in about $1,000 and I made $3,000. And then I was like, I'm out. 
Uh, so I, so that, that's my whole bit. That's my whole, uh, crypto that's your whole Bitcoin story, yeah. right? Like had I invested a hundred grand, I would have done really well. But so I got in late, but I was like, okay, I got $3,000. It's something. Um, and I had also been kind of paying attention to some Dave Ramsey stuff and decided to get out of debt for, for the first time in a long time. I was very blessed to not be deeply, but I, I was able to get rid of all the credit cards. So I was at the stage in my life where I was finally debt free, had a tiny, tiny bit of cash enough to buy a really junky used car. Um, or in my case in 2018, uh, a meth lab single wide trailer on one acre in rural Tennessee. Um, this was a foreclosed home for $10,000. It was a truly a living nightmare of a home. It was, I'm not exaggerating when I said I tested it for meth and it tested positive. It had human feces in the walls. It had piles of trash. It had a whole nother trailer that was there illegally that, that uh, there was a note from the county that came with the deed. I had to have that removed. Um, it was, it was a nightmare. And I went in and I was, I bought it with every penny I had I actually remaxed out my credit cards to buy it. So that was my mortgage was credit cards. Um, and so that was my first homestead was this acre. And I spent the first year or two just cleaning it up, um, just utterly overwhelmed, but really learning to, to garden on that lot, which I needed to do because I couldn't afford food because I had just bought a house with a credit card. <laughs> um, and so learning to be frugal, but truly I was immediately thrown into a place where I need to garden and I need to actually provide for my food because it's ramen noodles supplemented with vegetables is what I was eating. Um, so that was my first foray, very unplanned. But at that time, I began to study permaculture and, and uh, uh, studied it informally at first, really delving into the world of YouTube and books and books like um, Gaia's Garden and uh, the Ruth Stout Method and, and just learning about regenerative agriculture and how and it resonated so much with me because, first of all, I don't like spending money. And that's what conventional gardening agriculture is. You you Google something like, oh, how do I grow tomatoes? And they're like, buy this input and this input and this input. And so it appealed to me to not have to do all of that but also to build a system where I'm actually farming my land. It doesn't count as farming to me if if you're just buying a bunch of inputs and then growing, if you're buying a bunch of fertilizer and things. I want to actually take the stuff in my soil and turn it into food. Um, and so I studied, started studying more formally. I took the uh, course from Tagari, which is Bill Mollison's original permaculture course. And I took that and then I started working with an excavator so I could learn earthworks. And I started working on an organic farm again. Um, and when 2020 rolled around um, was when I really got to see the benefit of having a homestead because I was still making my living from music and I was standing on, it was a very, uh, it was a moment that stands out in my mind very strongly because I was on the third floor of a honky tonk in Nashville, one of those really big honky tonk bars. And I was it, was, it was sort of like being on the sinking Titanic because they had already been closing most of the bars for the lockdown. And I was watching police go from door to door, um, closing down these bars. And it was, it was, uh, it was such a stark thing to see police with guns closing down businesses against their will. Um, and then, you know, immediately my career of 10 years was gone. My only job skill, which was music, was gone. Um, and so suddenly I was thrust into unemployment and in a world gone crazy. Fortunately, I'd made that connection with that organic farm, that excavator. So I started doing more, more real work. Um, and I also started uh, kind of looking around me and saying, OK, how do I make a living from this property? Um, it's not much. There's an acre here and there's not much garden. Um, but it, it immediately rewired my brain to think I need to make a living from my land. I need to be resilient in my income streams. I need to know how to make a living if they try to take my living away from me like they did. Because in the end, the musicians were first. They always are. The artists and musicians and academics are first when a totalitarian regime takes over. And then after that comes everybody else's jobs. And so there's no, I, I, let's see, what's the wording they use? Um, uh, necessary. I forget the wording they use for the necessary jobs, but pretty soon everybody's you know career will become an unnecessary when the time is right. And so I realized I needed to control. I need to be self-sufficient, not just in my food, because that certainly too. I mean, you saw what happened in Europe where grocery stores, your access to that grocery store was determined by your, your medical compliance. Um, but I also saw that I'm going to need to provide my own income as well. Um, so that started my journey and then my wife, Gabby, her journey as well. And we started to really explore how do we make a living? from our land, especially having marginal land, having hardly any land, being on top of a dry hillside with very little in resources. Um, so we started just trying everything. Um, right around 2020, I started buying, I would buy these old uh, food grade barrels, 55 gallon barrels. I'd put a spigot on them and then I, and turn them into a rainwater catchment barrel. I had to learn to do it for my property because we didn't have a, a creek or a well or any good clean water. And so once I learned how, I was like, well, this is a product. I knew where to get them cheap. And and that that was almost our that was our first foray really into our own business and and it was a profitable little sideline it was really good it, it gave us some cash the transactions were all cash which was great 
Um, and it was also really cool because I, I would go deliver these barrels around Nashville and Middle Tennessee, and I would meet the people who were gardeners. And so I, I spent about a year really getting to meet people. They would give me things. They would give me plants and starts. And, and I got to see a lot of setups. And it was really cool, especially as I was studying permaculture. I got to see a lot of really good urban setups and rural setups as well. Um, and so around that time, I realized how much I liked it, how much I really loved being being involved in not only my own self-sufficiency, but other people's self-sufficiency as well. And so it was at that time I decided to pursue the, the homestead design route um, using the design science of permaculture, where you use the it teaches you these principles of how to design a, a property to really passively generate food in a re, in a regenerative manner that builds your soil, that builds your water table, that makes your land really better than you got onto it. So if you have kids or even if you don't, you're leaving that per, that land in better shape. You're getting better yields every year. You're doing it in a manner that's not causing problems. It's solving problems. Um, and so I, I went ahead and my wife and I started our business, Tennessee Homestead Design, and that was our first kind of more solid business we started. Um, and so from there, I started going around designing other people's business, uh, designing other people's farms. And I was thrust right into it because it was 2021 at that point. And so everyone was still panicking. <laughs> we were all not sure how far, far that thing was going to go. Um, we didn't know that if there was going to be a lull like we're in right now, or if it was just going to go all the way right into 1933. <laughs> and so um, I had a lot of business right away. And so I was thrust into 300 acre farm projects and um, intentional community projects and little tiny urban lots and everything in between. Um, and so I learned so much so rapidly about that while at the same time we were building out our own homestead. By this time, we had moved on to our current property. Uh, it was a five acre property. We sold an acre, so four acre property. And so at that point, we built a home from scratch, figured out how to do a septic, figured out how to do all of these things that are required to build a home, and then uh, build our own outbuildings and all of that. And so that was super invaluable too for, for our business was learning how to do that. Um, and then uh, that around that time, so Tennessee Homestead Design was getting busy. Around that time, uh, we had a, our first baby. And that also changed the equation because um, I was driving around a lot doing homestead design, you know, going to Alabama and East Tennessee, which I still do. Um, but I was I was gone a lot. And I was also still at that time, things were coming back, starting to flow in Nashville. So I was also commuting to Nashville to play music. Um, and so suddenly, you know, having a baby in the mix, it's like, well, I really don't want to be gone every day. I don't want to be on the road this much. Um, I want my living close to home. It might have been, I guess, a little bit later than 2021 at that point. Um, but at that point, that's when we realized we really need to also have more products coming off of our land. We need to be growing things. And so our first foray was into market garden vegetables. Um, that was not the right fit for our property because we are on tap water. We can do water catchment, which is great, but not that's not the like vegetables are water. And if you don't have an abundant water source, that's not the right business endeavor is to grow vegetables for other people, which is a very important lesson. Um, and so at that point, I, I had to really think, what can I realistically do? We have four acres, but realistically, it's one acre because um, the rest is just really steep and, and wooded. Um, and so I was very invested in perennials at this time, you know, because I believe per perennial agriculture is so important for building a homestead, fruit trees, nut trees and shrubs. And so I decided that's what that's the route we needed to pursue. So we started our home nursery um, and we started learning to take cuttings from our own things that we'd already planted, like elderberry, um, currants, things like that. And then also I started buying bare roots in bulk. I would buy really big giant orders that um, one, if you can buy in a really big, large quantity, it, it's a lot cheaper per unit. And so I would get these bulk orders in and then we would just pot them up, make our, we started a big composting operation designed a chicken coop just for that. Um, started doing thousands and thousands of these trees. And then we just started figuring out how to sell them. Fortunately, I have a wife who does did marketing for a living, still does. Um, and so we had that asset as well. And so we started marketing them on social media. Um, we started bringing the festivals like Self-Reliance Festival. We sold a lot of places like that. We tried different things. We tried roadside stands. We um, tried different events, tried the farmer's market. Um, we eventually bought a piece of property to put a, a small roadside stand on, which is kind of a cool, cool story on its own. It's a very unique little piece of property that was usable for nothing else. Um, and yeah, so that was, so year one was last year of the nursery. And we finally sat down and tallied our numbers up, um, in our disorganized state the best we could. And, um, it was profitable. It was a good first year. We were in the black. We didn't make bank or anything. We didn't make a full-time living just from the nursery, but we had our many other sidelines. We had the homestead design, Gabby does marketing. Um, and I was working on man helping manage a few other farms as well at that point. Um, 
And so this is year two that we're in right now. And we've learned so many lessons and we just did our, I think you saw, we just did our first year two launch and it's been a madhouse five times busier than last year. Cause now, now we've built the infrastructure. Our name is established. People are coming back to us. We're getting repeat business. Um, and we figured out what does work and what doesn't to, to some degree. And so it's very exciting because we're really for the first times in our lives, we're seeing our businesses become successful and seeing ourselves being able to start choosing where to spend our time. And of course, that's meaning that we're choosing to spend our time closer to home. So when I hear this story, I hear somebody who six years ago put a property on a credit card in addition to having $3,000 from Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> and... I th the the interesting part of your story there is the part you glossed over mm -hmm. where you you lived on your property. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. While trying to build out your property <clears throat> with a basically a mobile home that was unlivable. Yeah, that's and that's crucial. <clears throat> How did you do that? How long were you doing that for? Yeah, so that was a period of about 1 to 2 years. Amazingly, I was dating Gabby at the time, so she is a keeper. Yeah. She's a Fortunately, she had seen me when I did not live in a meth lab. So that that helped my case a little bit. But it was an overwhelming and, and emotionally and spiritually challenging time, to say the least. Um, so I, I so a little bit more backstory on that, because, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's very relevant to to those who have any kind of excuse to not homestead. This, yes. will, this will remove every excuse. That is exactly where I'm going with this. So how did you? Um, you're, so you're the second person in two weeks I've talked to about what they had to do to get their homestead. Awesome. So what happened was um, in my get rich quick scheme mind that I had at the time, I thought, okay, I've got this property. What do I do um, to climb out of this financial hole that I just put myself in? At the time, I was still living in Nashville, um, renting a room out and very much still in the musician life. And so what I did was I, I figured, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll work out a deal. I found some folks. I don't remember how. Um, and here's a lesson of what not to do. Who We worked out a deal. They would fix it up. For about three to six months for free rent in exchange um and then we've all made this mistake matt yes. i've so, done it too just so you know the kind of people that will move into a meth lab usually are probably drug addicts um and so the the folks that i got to rent out this house to do this they were going to work on it for three months and then start paying rent after so they'd get three months free improve the house and then start paying a pretty low price rent well the rent never got paid and uh things got worse at the property not better um, it became, once again, it, it returned to its glory days as a drug house. Um, I started getting reports from the neighbors that there was a lot of traffic coming in and out of there. At one time they put up a pawn shop sign on the trailer in the middle of the woods. Um, so it was bad. So I got to learn all about the eviction process there, which fortunately we live in a red state. So it's, it's still on, you know, the courts are still in, on the side of the landowner to some degree. Um, and so, but I actually, here's something, if you ever have to evict somebody, Swallow your pride and pay them. It, it was a lot cheaper. I got the eviction. It cost me about yeah. I've report. learned that one too. Yep. And yep. I went in with money. I said, I will hand this when you're in your truck, um, ready to leave the house. Um, and so that was really good. And it actually kept me on good terms because you also don't want to make enemies with with meth heads. <laughs> um, so I, I remained on good terms with them, and they were a family in need, you know, despite it being a, from their own mistakes. And so it, it was it was a better way to do that. So, but that left me very deep in a hole now because I had had no revenue coming in credit card bills piled up, um, had to pay for this eviction. Um, and so it was time to move into the, the trailer because I now had no money and I couldn't pay my rent in Nashville. So I moved into this, this nightmare, um, and started working away at it while still working music full time. And it was so overwhelming. I mean, there was piles, the piles of garbage were as tall as a house. Um, and I had no money to do the cleanup with. I couldn't hire a tractor to come in. I couldn't, and there was a whole abandoned trailer in the back. In addition to the one I was living in that needed torn down and removed. And I actually tore that down and moved it out in a minivan because I couldn't afford dump fees. So I would put, I, so I put a whole house in garbage bags and threw it away at the dump for free. Um, but it was emotionally overwhelming. There was times when I was like, is this how it happens? Is this how you become a trashy person in a trailer and you just give up <laughs> at a certain point? And cause I also didn't really have a lot of handyman skills. I didn't have the skills needed to really build a homestead. Um, so I was very overwhelmed, but kept at it for two years and slowly just the fact that I didn't have to pay rent and was willing to live in this. And I mean, it was squalor. Like when winter came, there was no, there was no skirting underneath. So we literally, we picked one room in the center of the building. We cardboarded up the windows and the doors. We put towels under the doors just to keep the air out. And we ran one space heater in the center of it. And we lived in the one room out of that trailer um, because there was holes in the rest. There was, 
it, it was truly unlivable. Um, and keep in mind, just to Gabby's credit, that that she was dating me at this time. Like we would have our our dates in that one room, <laughs> just like, oh, let's light a candle so it doesn't feel so bad. Um, and and just to really paint a full picture, the walls were scribbled with like satanic graffiti and just everything that you would expect out of a drug house. Yeah, I know. Was, I know exactly what I've had to clean up one of mine after mm -hmm. that. It's, it's like, and it's like scary. It's like there's a spirit in like a place like that of like, yeah, I'm not there's a burning a vibe. Yeah, yeah, there's a vibe. To get to, like I've literally had properties blessed mm -hmm. because I was like, the vibe is wrong. And like, I have to bring this back to positive yeah. and yeah. we need somebody out here to bless this. Yeah, that's very much how it felt. Um, and so the, I slowly, slowly, slowly started to get out of that hole. And, um, I finally got to the place to where it was pretty much, I never fixed anything on that house, by the way. I, I just cleaned it up, cleaned up the yard. I planted a garden. I, I dug my first swale, planted my first fruit trees, um, and cleaned up that trailer in the back. So all I did was clean up a lot of it, not even all of it. And at that point, um, a, a little cabin next to it came up for sale. I kind of skipped a step in the story. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I purchased that with owner financing so that I could then sell the other trailer wonderful family bought that trailer he was a drywaller and an experienced construction worker and preppers and everything as well um and so they they took over that project and continued it and have done they still live there and have done amazing things they've turned it into a beautiful house um the interior looks brand new uh they've continued the garden they brought in chickens they've continued homesteading um he works in the fire department he's become a part of the community so super cool story that 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 property got redeemed got to see a new life and and uh, that peach tree that i bought at a Walmart in Alabama while I was on tour and planted in the backyard is now a full size peach tree. And I've, I've taken cuttings off it and it's born, it's had fruit and everything. Um, so, so super, super cool to see that, that make it, but it was just a willingness to live in truly stark third world conditions. How long were you, how long was that? Like a year? It was about two years, roughly. Two years. Um, yeah. I'm kind of okay. estimating it's all of it. You know, it's been such a blur of, and so much moving and kind of halfway because I bought a cabin next to it. So I was halfway in between the two for a while. Yeah. Um, but it, it was, and it, there was a lot of personal challenges in myself that I had to overcome as a result. Like it wasn't just that I was in an overwhelming situation. I really, I had diligence problems. I had, I, I would feel so overwhelmed and I had no faith at the time in anything. And so I would just, I would feel def so defeated at times I wouldn't work instead of going out and, and cleaning it up. Well, let's I'm talk about that. Cause I, we've been talking a lot about mental health lately mm -hmm. and um, people, you know, like, how do you stay motivated? Well, the answer is you're not motivated every single day. Mm -mm. And even though you weren't motivated every single day, at some point you got over it. Mm -hmm. And you it got helps it, to remove, it helps to remove all of your other choices. <laughs> yeah. You burned every bridge. Yeah. And you're yeah. like, I got no bridges left. I guess I just gotta start taking one step in front of mm -hmm. the other. No, but yeah, it, it was very challenging. I, I drank a lot at the time too. So yeah. that I, I wasn't in a good place necessarily while doing that. I was slowly, it was a part of my journey into a better place because the, I, I truly believe that the food you're eating affects your mental state and your spiritual state. And so I was still living off of road food and drinking large amounts of alcohol. And so it, it makes you dumb. It makes you not able to think through problems. It makes you, it's, you know, fast food is a drug too. Sugar is a drug. Alcohol is a drug. And so instead of dealing with problems, you just find, you find a mental distractant instead. Um, and so that was a, that was all a struggle I was undergoing at the time. Um, and like, that's, that's the story of every homesteader. I see so much of that with my business. I see so much around me um, with, with the, the nonprofit we started for the festival back to land. We see a lot of it too is just homesteading is it's truly more than a full-time job but you also have to work a full-time job and so you're throwing yourself into this financial burden you're already doing it probably because you have either a health issue or a tyranny issue or some other issue that's driving you into the home both now, or both and tyranny <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah both sometimes interrelated um yeah. and so you already have that issue in your life many people are starting a family or getting married or something at the same time. And so you're, you're dealing with all these challenges in yourself. A lot of people are undergoing a spiritual transformation in their life too. That's it's like all of these things kind of accumulate when you start homesteading because you're, I mean, when you change your diet, you're rewiring your brain, you're, you're changing everything. And so it's, it's a hard challenging time. And so, yeah, if anybody's in that journey, just know that it's, it's a, you're following a pattern that it's not just you and it's happened a lot. One day, it is my dream 
that somebody who's in the midst of that homestead struggle will say yes to my offer to please speak at SRF or at my spring workshop. Because hmm. here's what happens when I ask people in the midst of that to speak. They say, I don't know anything about homesteading and I'm mm -hmm. not doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is all of us did a bad job. Yeah. Our first couple years of homesteading mm -hmm. while we were learning how to do it. And we felt like failures and it was a huge challenge that we had to overcome. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, yeah. and I will say every time I fail, like we lost a, a ram last week. Every mm -hmm. time I fail, it hurts again. It's just like a punch in the gut, especially when it's an animal. That's the worst because you feel abusive. You feel like neglectful. Yeah. You feel like a bad owner, a bad steward. Um, it's very hard when you fail with an animal. And I, I remember there was a lot of that initially where I, I killed animals like rabbits and stuff that did not, you know, had I done things right, they would have lived. And But even now, like pretty recently, we had some goat deaths that were due to us not fully understanding how to net we were trying to naturally combat their pet their parasite cycle oh. and there were just some pieces of the puzzle we didn't yet know yeah. um and yeah we lost them and, and it wasn't necessary and it was it's so hard you just feel yeah like an abject like you just want to quit every time so yeah you just know if you're going into homesteading or if you're in the middle of it that's going to happen and it will improve if you and one thing i do want to say like that's really important in that i, I kind of mentioned earlier but there there was a lot that's it's just the situation you're in it's you're you are you are tackling a mount everest but also do be open to the lessons about your own habits you need to change um for, for myself i i became a christian in 20 in 2021 after i like walked away from the church and all that in childhood but when i began to read it for myself i i was just like i'm just gonna read this like the law and apply it to my life and a big part of it was proverbs which is like proverbs is written by an empire builder is written by solomon mostly so he's a dude that built one of the biggest empires in the bronze age. So it's mostly it's directed men and women can read it, but it's very much directed at a man. It's like advice from a father to a son. And a lot of that was about diligence. And there's some really like, there's a, I don't remember the exact wording of it, but it's like a passage about like, Oh, a little more sleep, a, a little, a, you know, kind of reset the snooze on the alarm. And then poverty creeps up on you like a bandit. It's, it's a great phraseology. And so that was a huge change for me in the homesteading journey was simply I looked up the definition of diligence because I kept seeing that word and diligence was not working harder. That's what I thought. Cause all my life I thought I was a hard worker. Diligence is setting yourself to a task and working tirelessly at that task. And so, cause you can work hard at 50 different things and scatter yourself. And that's what we all do at the homestead. Cause we start 50,000 projects for me. Cause it's a disease. Yes, it is. And you're excited <laughs> about the new thing. So you go yeah. do the new thing. <laughs> so learning to practice diligence was a game changer. That's when it was like, you know what? I'm going to put this tool away in its place in the shed instead of thinking, I just don't have time. I need to get to this new thing. Because I was like, well, that's wrong. That's not. And diligent. now I spend the next 27 hours looking for this. Looking for that tool. tool. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And so it was amazing to watch. I'm still crawling out of it. But to watch that snowball turn around from chaos back into order, like the workshop is getting better. The yard's getting better. The house has gotten better. And it, and it's exponential. It's kind of like building wealth. When you're deeply in debt, you're paying interest. And so it's so hard to pay off that debt just to get out of that, that pit. Once you do, now suddenly you have this extra money that you were spending on interest every year. And now that can be applied to wealth building. Not And so it's it's exponential. And so it's the same with diligence. Is like once I started to reverse those bad habits, um, then suddenly I would find, okay, I've improved this chicken system. Now I have another 10 minutes of my day that I didn't have before. Now I can catch up on these projects that I was drowning in. And so You're that's the first person I've ever heard compelled compare that to building wealth. It's exactly the same. And it's a hundred percent exactly the same. Yeah. Cause it and, is wealth. Like, like yeah. your, your wealth, when you get, you know, you know, you're a person who understands that fiat is just one measure and probably a pretty bad measure of wealth. And wealth is in living capital. It's in social capital. It's in, there's lots of different forms of capital and your homestead is your biggest asset. That's going to be, I mean, that's what this whole interview is about is turning your homestead into an asset. And so it's not going to function like an asset until it's starting to run well. And that takes one step at a time mm -hmm. and not, and it's not instantaneous It's and, and work. And mm -hmm. it, so I did 75 hard last year which is a program where have you heard of it mm -mm. okay so 75 hard i was like i gotta change something because i'm not staying disciplined enough mm -hmm. and as a result of not being disciplined i'm disappointing a lot of people because i'm breaking promises and mm -hmm. i was not okay with that so you have to work out twice a day for 45 minutes one of them outside every day no breaks mm -hmm. 
choose a diet and stick to it. You can choose whatever diet that is. No cheat days, no alcohol, uh, read 10 pages of a nonfiction book mm -hmm. and then take a picture of your progress every day. I think that's all five things. That's awesome. That's cool. And that's it every day for 75 days, every day for 30 days is not a problem. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that by day 60, I was pretty sick. Oh, I drink a gallon of water. The water was the one I hated the most. Actually. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. A gallon's a lot. I drink a gallon of water anyway, most days, but the days where my body doesn't want the gallon, like there were days where I was like, okay, it's 11 o'clock at night. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Like it's just, just to, to tick the box. Yeah. But what that does is it, it teaches you discipline mm -hmm. and to figure out how to make things happen that you wouldn't usually make happen. Like for me, two yeah. 45 minute workouts, that's an hour and a half of time every day as a homesteader, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, Whoa. Yeah. Um, where am I finding that time? Yeah. Where am I finding that time? You can though, if you make it happen um, and you sleep really well mm -hmm. after that uh, breaking the alcohol cycle. Like you, mm -hmm. I like my cocktails mm -hmm. and um I often would go weeks without any drinks, but by the time I'd gone 75 days, like now I drink maybe twice a week, one mm. beverage. Yeah. And I don't actually usually want another one because if I have another one, it makes me feel physically sick. Well, that is my body telling me that nutritionally, perhaps the bourbon isn't good for me. That's exactly what happened. And it was probably also part of me entering my thirties too, is like your body's like, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, I still have a drink from time to time. I just don't drink as much. And it doesn't like what it did to my budget is I wasn't buying as much alcohol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that, that creates a little space. I had something really lucky happen to me last year. It was a mistake where I didn't have to pay my electric bill for like a year. Cause I have electricity. I'm mm -hmm. not off grid. And, but at the end of the year, I had to pay the whole bill. Mm hmm like no late fees or anything, but it was just like for a while, didn't pay the monthly electric bill. And my average monthly electric bill is probably 75 bucks. It's, it's not mm -hmm. a lot. I don't heat with electricity. Mm -hmm. The amount of value I got from not paying that $75 had been in my budget was way more than the cumulative amount I paid at the end of the year, just mm -hmm. because it made cash flow space of $75. It's kind of like if you're filing taxes the standard way or paying taxes, it's like you always want to do self-employment to where you don't want to take it out of your check every month. You want to do it all at the end because think about like that's in, you could be collecting interest on that if it's invested or in more practical terms, pouring that into your homestead that generates some revenue. And now you, you have that chunk of change plus that. Yeah, it just to it's it's so much better to hang on and as long as you can to cash. Yeah. So it was, it was just interesting, but your homestead, when you get past the mad scramble chaos, everything's going on at one time. I overcommitted, added too many projects. Mm -hmm. I need to build this. I need to build that. That's breaking. Like we've been in this, a, a which never process. ends by the way, that, that it never does. Yeah. We're still things never stop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that never ends, but it gets better and you get better at managing it. That's what happens. Yeah. And that's the answer. Nobody wants to hear. They want to hear like, Oh, there's an end in sight. No, there's no end in sight. You're be, first of all, your ambitions will never change. You're going to want to tackle the next project. You're like, okay, finally got these goats under control time for dairy cow. Um, yeah. So that's not going to change. And also like homesteads are dynamic places. A farm is a dynamic thing. That's going to change. The climate will change. Your weather will change. Your financial situation will change. Your needs will change. You know, we, as we built our family, suddenly our dietary needs of our family changed drastically. Kids eat a lot of food or suddenly like, oh, now I have a baby. I want to have a dairy source on my farm. But now what's that dairy source going to eat? What's that goat going to eat? And so it, yeah, you, instead of waiting for that, ma that magic bullet doesn't come. Your management gets better. You get better at managing time. The, you have to accept the busy, that's a bitter pill. You have to accept the busyness. Like I'm a person that, as an artist, I want to relax and have my creative time. I'm having to learn to be disciplined about my creative time and say, I'm and both my wife and I are like, okay, you get this one hour on Saturdays for right now. I get this one hour on Saturdays and we'll try to grow that time. But like you, you will be busy all the time and you have to learn to accept it and be, and be okay with being busy. But also, you know, as you get it, you, the whole purpose of going to the homestead life, especially if you're doing it, trying to get your income from it is you're also moving towards doing things you like to do with your time. And yeah. so accepting the business, but then also realize like, well, this is what I wanted to do. <laughs> you know, this is not sitting in an office all day. So it, that's been a part of my, me, my journey is I've had to accept it and be like, okay, I'm, I'm okay with all these problems. When a problem pops up, that's what homesteading is. That's what running businesses. It's 
it's nothing but problem solving and figuring out how to manage this time and, and manage my resources and my limited income. And just, you're just moving, but like you're, when you're a farmer, you're just moving nutrients around and, and objects around and, and your finances and your whole homestead is no different. You're moving money around, you're doing, you're working with what you have and stewarding with what you have. It's there. It doesn't matter if you have a lot of money or a tiny bit of money to homestead with. It's that's irrelevant. You're, you have a certain amount of something to steward, whether that's a, you are a homeless person with a tent and you found a patch of grass that nobody's watching and you're homesteading that, or you're, you have a million dollars to work with. Like you have what you have and that's what, those are the resources you have to manage. And, and your time is the same. You just have to learn to manage it. I call it investing my time. Mm -hmm. I invested fair. my time this weekend in moving poop, mm -hmm. mulch and wood chips, which mm -hmm. is not glamorous at all. Not from any, but what will that, what, what will that, in, what will that now yield? What will I enjoyed it the whole time, Matt. Mm -hmm. Like I was shoveling poop and I enjoyed mm -hmm. it. And that's, that's because I look forward to, <laughs> I know. I mean, it's like, you know, like, wow, all this fertility is going into my garden and I got to listen mm -hmm. to a podcast while I was doing it. And I got mm -hmm. exercise and I was outside. It was a beautiful weekend with the sun. Mm -hmm. I heard, you know, when I wasn't listening to the podcast, I could hear the birds. Like I did a video of just my garden and I didn't even mm -hmm. consciously realize it was like chirp, 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 like this, mm -hmm. this chorus of birds is going off. And I'm like, that's why I live here. Yeah. Right. And so I call that investing time because yeah. sure, you know, not nobody wakes up on Monday morning and says, you know what I want to do today? I want to shovel poop, <laughs> but you kind of do when you get into mm -hmm. it as a homesteader. And investing, it's if anybody's read like the Robert K Robert Kiyosaki's book on finances, like one thing he says, and a lot of if you talk to any wealthy people, they'll probably tell you this, which is you buy assets with your money, not liabilities, and meaning things that generate value. You don't buy a TV, you don't buy a, unless there's a way for that. Like in your case, maybe as a podcast or something, there's a way for that TV to have a practical value. But you don't buy a car except what you need to work. Um, you don't buy a house unless that house is gonna create a financial yield and so that's the way they think of wealth when they build it and your time is very much the same don't you can't buy liabilities with your time like sitting in front of a tv is buying a liability with your time and it will result in a time debt <laughs> in a way and so you invest your time into something that's going to generate value and then it's just like building wealth like i'm glad we're on this metaphor track of time and money because it's it's very much the same yeah it, it's there's no different in fact your time is more valuable than than money mm -hmm. you can't print time they can print all the money yeah. they want like when you're old and you die, if instead of spending time with your babies and your wife, mm -hmm. you were off doing something else, you're going to regret that. Mm -hmm. But every moment you spend with them, you're going to remember like chasing, you know, chasing your kid around the yard or, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. I don't know where you're at right now. Age it's like two, two or three. Yeah, coming up on that. Mm -hmm. So walk in. Like yeah. this is the annoying phase where they climb mm -hmm. things you don't want them to climb. They have new superpowers every day. Yeah, you're like they can run amazingly fast. Yes, right out into the road, like Reach everything you thought you baby proofed. <laughs> yeah, right, right, and you know it's it's funny because every kid goes through this, but at, as the parent at this phase, you end up also exhausted from that, and then you're mm -hmm. homesteading on top of it. Yeah. So. But it's the investment stage and, and kind of like you're talking about with like, so using the, the idea of, of the compost that you're making the manure is like you're investing your time, but that will create more time later. Like I spent my life not investing my time. I spent my life squandering my time. And so here I am in my thirties playing catch up really with my life and building, finally building financial security and, and all of this. But when you are investing your time, regardless of where your starting point is like, yeah, we all wish we were 18 to start over, but whatever stage you're at, when you're investing your time in that compost, now that's becoming a super passive garden, which is less trips to the grocery store, less trips to the hospital later on in life, um, less work in the garden. Cause you, let's say you're doing like a no-till, you're piling that compost on. It's reducing your, your, your weeding and just like exponential wealth building. It's like, okay, now because of those things, I have this extra time. Great. I'm going to build a a rotational grazing system now that's going to make it so I don't need to go buy feed for my goats and my cattle. All right, great. Now I've done that. And now all that money I was spending that $200 a week, I don't have to go work my day job to get that. Like it's that exponential growth of time. When you invest time, you get a yield, you get a dividend from that and you're buying more time later on down the road. Yep. But it's not without sacrifice. You know, I, mm -hmm. Jack Spirico always says, I, you know, I didn't see you on my stairway at 430 in the morning mm -hmm. rushing to get to my office when I started <laughs> my podcast. I'm like, I don't know any business owner that hasn't gone through that phase yeah. 
uh, I've gone through it more than once. I'm going to go through it again, I'm sure. But uh, okay, so let's get back to five years ago, Matt. Did you think you would own a nursery? Oh, no, no. What was, I, I, what, how did you think you'd make your money? I thought I'd have a hit song and and uh, <laughs> and then just now I always wanted to go back to the country. But when I was purely pursuing the the music lifestyle, um, I was in a really a place of pride and ego at the time. And I wanted to have that hit song, that validation and the, and the money from that I was in the country music industry. Um, and so I wanted to get a big pile of, of get rich quick money and go buy my place in the country. And now I'm so grateful that that did not happen. Um, I, yeah, I had, but it never occurred to me that I would be farming for a living or, or doing doing agriculture for a living. I always did want a homestead that like growing up in the country on the edge of the Tillamook Forest in, in uh, Oregon, just in beauty, absolute beauty. It looked like Narnia out there. Uh, you can never quite leave that behind. I knew I was going back to the country at some point. I still can't leave behind when I plant broccoli. Yeah. 17 <laughs> years later. So, yeah. <laughs> but no, I did, it did not occur to me that I, I would be doing this, especially this soon. Um, I was, you know, I was in that stage of life that you were talking about, like the alcohol cycle. Like I was in a, uh, alcohol is a depressant. So I was depressed and I was just, there was no really vision of the future. There was no, certainly no plan. There was lots of ambition, lots of, and that's, that's the story of our, of my generation in particular, like the millennial generation is all ambition and we're all, we're very self-aware and we're very, uh, get rich quickie, you know, like we're surrounded by these YouTube get rich quick schemes and MLMs. And like, it's that our culture is about pursue money and, and then you can have what you want. And so I'm so glad I did not get that because first of all, I didn't have my diligence habits. So if had you handed me $500,000 from having a hit song, um, it would have been squandered or poorly invested, or I would have bought a homestead and become just as overwhelmed. I would like, it wouldn't have been good. I was taught the management of things with the journey I had. And, uh, and I'm grateful for it. But yeah, I did, did not see myself going down this route. Like, and, and I'm so thankful for what happened in 2020. I'm because it also, you know, is a, a spiritual catalyst for me too to see, to see all this organized tyranny. And when you deeply research it, you see how it goes to the top of a pyramid and you see like, oh, all those Sunday school stories about like the devil and stuff like seem to be pretty spot on. <laughs> and so, it was, or at least you see how that hierarchy works. And so had that not happened, I would not have homesteaded. I would have maybe not gotten married. I would have not, um, become a believer i would have not changed my life so like thank god for that that cattle like thank thank i'm so thankful for that evil thing that happened because that set me on this journey that's like my health has changed too the the nature of homesteading is like i would get the flu really bad a few times a year i thought that was normal turns out it's not you start foraging and you start eating and you eat a lot of wild food and a lot of fresh grown food instead you just get the sniffles and then it goes away and my allergies completely went away and like all these health problems i had went away now the my worst health problem is I'm really sore at the end of every day, but, but, uh, my sleep problems went away, like mostly went away, like a lot, like, so all of this stuff just changed. Um, and so yeah, five years ago, no concept that I would be right here. Something that was really funny related to how your immune system gets better on a homestead, Joel Salatin, who was out last fall mm -hmm. mentioned that every so often he just walks up to the cow trough and drinks out of it. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I'm just trying to get exposed to as many things as possible. So I have a strong <laughs> microbiome. And, mm -hmm. and he said, I'm probably the only person that fights illness by drinking out of a, a cow trough. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well. But he'll be the last one here. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen him sick a lot. That so It's, it's funny. This is like kind of a different, a different way of seeing that same thing. Um, during the COVID narrative, when everyone was getting sick, because we were all suppressing our immune systems, uh, the I was in. I was in the musician community, downtown Broadway, Nashville. So it's like each one of those bars is like 500 people crammed into a bar from all over the world. They, they all flew in to this tourist city and they're spitting requests into your face. And everyone's going backstage and sharing vape pens and joints and stuff. And like, like you could not get into a more germy cesspool. And like none of them got sick. <laughs> they were all, and a lot of those musicians were like pretty far left. So they were all big believers in it. But like, Almost none of the people I know in that circle got any serious illness because they had been exposed to every single, like whatever the next one they're planning is, I probably have already had it. Like think about sharing a mic. Mm -hmm. I sing into a mic and I hand it to you for yeah. your set. And then some drunk girl gets up and sings into it. And yeah. that's, from, that's from like, they just flew in from France and brought whatever they have going on over there. Yeah, it's, it's a truly a cesspool. But yeah, it's the same. It's like, yeah, you build your immune system. And that's why we try to we try to be conscious of it. We try to leave a little bit of dirt on our vegetables and let that in and not be a hunt, not sanitize anything. We clean things. We want a clean environment, but we don't use any sanitizers on 
hardly anything like maybe the udders you'll use a little iodine on a cow or something like that um but yeah the more the more the merrier yeah build that immune system it's funny how that works and building your immune system guys is the same as building your community as we've also been talking about this it is week. a community you yeah. need to expand it's a community of of, of bacteria but mm -hmm. <laughs> that you learn how to fight but um that variation is pretty important okay so why did you decide like so what did you try and decide not to do for your income on the homestead yeah so first of all everything we tried i, I you know in, in my efforts to be concise i've, I've glossed over a lot so <laughs> we tried many many things and we are still trying lots of things um and so let me just kind of buzz through some of them so um i, I don't know if you've seen uh, the, the show arrested development um, is a great Netflix show, but in that show, um, it's this wealthy family that's kind of like lost their wealth, but their original way they got wealthy was their banana stand. They had this banana stand where they sold frozen bananas out of a, out of a little stand. And then they became, you know, stockbrokers and all this and, and millionaires. And so Gabby and I jokingly call the barrels our banana stand. That's what, you know, that's what, that was our first like foray into business. And, and it just gave us a little bit of cash to put into other things on the farm. So the, um, so I'll talk about ones we did do because I'm just going to do these as I remember. So I'll talk about ones that worked and ones that didn't work or ones that needed refined. Um, so the barrels were first and we started making rainwater catchment barrels as well as just reselling them because I had a good source from a fruit company um, on everyone wants food grade barrels. Um, so I started making those rainwater catchment barrels and selling them um, and that spiraled into then doing installation of them too. Um, and then actually we found out that the spigot kits we were building were a pretty good solution because most of the ones on the market were really flimsy or they weren't adapted for garden hoses. So Gabby being a marketer and good at setting up websites, she set up, we put a YouTube video up showing how to do it. And then we actually put a link to sell those spigot kits to put on barrels yourself. And so that became a really good sideline that we still have going. We're still making uh, decent sales. And that video is just passively every once in a while goes to our website. Somebody watches it and buys a spigot kit. Um, actually I have three that I was supposed to send out today that I forgot. Um, so that was a success. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. The that day's was, not over yet. <laughs> no, no. And so that was, that was a, a good one, a little successful one, but there was a lot of lessons learned what not to do. And we're still figuring this out. But, um, one thing was that we didn't have an organized system. So every sing single time we got an order, I'm digging through my mess of a shed, looking for these different components and assembling it. So oh, it was a lesson wow. in nerding to, I needed to set up a system for anything that I'm trying to do on any scale. Um, our next foray was into market was selling vegetables. And that one was pretty much a failure. One reason is why is we jumped in too soon because we needed to have our own vegetables, our own food. We all want to get excited and want to build a business first, but we needed to be like, we were sometimes we were selling vegetables and we were then going out and buying vegetables from other farms. Yeah. That doesn't make sense at all. No, it doesn't make sense. And, it, and it's your ego leading the way when you're doing that. That's what we were doing. Um, and so, I had to dial back that because also my property wasn't right for that. And you're just going to have to learn that your property's not right for some things. Yeah. Um, so vegetable now it wasn't a total, there was times we sold to caterers and we got a little additional income. It was really fun. We built good relationships. So it wasn't like a waste of time or anything, but um, it just, that wasn't a good worthy pursuit of our time. Um, Cause I also tack tackled too much garden space, which we all have done that one. Um, because I killed I, 140 tomatoes that way. Yeah. Before. And yeah, you learn like, to, and brought blight yeah. onto my property. Like I, it was, yeah terrible get to mm. catastrophe so so yeah that that one got and then it, and you know it's just put on hold for now too when we get to a different property i love the idea of a market garden farm so that may come back but it wasn't the right fit for us on our current situation so that one fell by the wayside um then we we as we were expanding our chicken flock we, we dabbled in selling eggs and i quickly realized that that was not profitable <laughs> there's no way somebody will spend enough on the eggs to justify it but that led me to finding a pretty good little sideline, which was incubating those eggs. So suddenly that egg, instead of being a few cents, um, turns into a $5 chick. Um, and I started, so that changed how we raised chickens too. I switched to just Americanas because those are popular sellers, the blue egg layers. Oh yeah, those are, you're mm -hmm. right. And, and I had to hatch, and so, and they're dual purpose. So I hatch them out. I keep all the roosters um, uh, or just some of them for meat birds because, you know, they're, a, they're an okay meat bird. They're fine. Um, and then I sell them either as full grown ones or as babies. Now, once, because our homestead was still not set up the way we needed, we we're still building our house. When Gabby and I were, it was just us. I could get away with incubating chickens and having that smell and stuff in the house. Um, Ooh, yeah. When baby came along, it was a little bit different. And so that's just something where there's just different seasons in your business and homestead and that, that had to wait. And so we decided to wait this year. We're not incubating eggs. I worked out a deal with somebody else that's incubating and I'll get some of my beet birds from them. But 
Um, so that was both a success for a while. Not not like it was bringing in tons of money, but the sales were covering my grain costs, which is really which is good. great. Like that's, also that's, yeah, that's that's you don't huge. Have to, yeah, because that's very expensive. But also what what I was trying to do there is also subsidize more chickens than I need because that was my compost source. And so even though that wasn't financially successful in terms of like, I'm making a living off it. The fact is like it allowed me to have about 50 birds, which gen which if you're doing the kind of chicken on steroids tractor system, um, yeah. you can generate a cubic yard of compost a year, which as we get later to the nursery, that was vital. Um, and to our mm -hmm. own garden, we just had, we needed, we needed a bunch of animals to efficiently make a bunch of compost. And that was the way. That's why um, I have rabbits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rabbits are phenomenal. For I that. feed the rabbits to the LGDs and it mm -hmm. makes really good yeah poop, and you got to stack those functions like that on the homestead yeah um let's see other ones that i, I tried firewood I, I can't coming from oregon I, I grew up in logging country all of my like ancestors were loggers and foresters and so i, I always did cite um a little bit of firewood as a sideline i kind of paid for some college that way too when i was younger but quickly realized that the maintenance on the chainsaw the the hours put in were abs and, and the danger that I was subjecting, you know, anytime you're working a chainsaw, you're risking life and limb. Like the most experienced loggers, I, I knew a lot of one armed people growing up in logging. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and so that I quickly realized that wasn't worth it. Um, I, I love working in the woods and cutting with a chainsaw to a degree, and then you then it becomes like, yeah, this is not not worth it. Um, yeah. Especially when you don't have a tractor or anything to haul or any processing or everything. Oh, like yeah, that. that makes a huge difference. Yeah, huge. Um, so that one, I, I quit doing that entirely um let's see some others um uh we 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 started raising goats and i started selling the babies that was a good that was a good sideline um because I, I wanted the goats for dairy but the result is you get a bunch of baby goats and i i think it's i think it's better in most like startup scenarios to just sell baby animals rather than process them for meat because mm -hmm. i was getting more for a baby goat than i would get or, if I raised it up to maturity and then spent all that time processing it into meat, same as the birds. I was looking at doing meat birds. Um, I studied all up on that and uh, I was, I was getting already, I was like, okay, I'm going to process chickens and sell the meat. And then I found like literally after all that work, I would sell them for less than selling the actual living bird without putting that work in. Mm. Uh, so that's one thought is, is sell things live. So with the baby goats, um, I was again, just kind of paying for grain input so that the dairy was free. It did get to a point where, I, I got too big on the goats and, and, and I talked about earlier when we were talking about how we lost some goats due to mismanagement. Um, and so we dialed that back. We said that that's another one that it wasn't totally unsuccessful, but it was causing us to expand before we should, before our pasture was ready. Um, and so I dialed back the goats drastically, sold off most of the herd and just kept a couple of my best ones. Um, so that, so a lot of these things are kind of ambiguous. They're not total flops and failures. They're just not the right thing. Um, the nursery we actually thought was kind of the wrong thing too after the first year because I, I lost so many plants. I didn't I didn't have a good sprinkler set up. I was, I was spending oh, yeah. an hour every day dragging a hose around. It was just because it was coming in so fast. Plants were coming so fast and we had a million of, you know, we got overwhelmed and it didn't go well. But then later on when we sat down and looked at the numbers, we're like, okay, we actually, even with all the loss and all the mistakes, um, we, we actually estimated every moment of time we put in, every input we put in, every bit of soil, every pot, every person we hired. Um, when we when we estimated all that, we're looking at it and we're like, okay, we made twenty dollars an hour. Not great. I can make that like the truck stop down the road is hiring at twenty dollars an hour, but that's first year of a business doing everything that wrong. Not bad. Not bad at all. And so that that made us make the decision to go ahead and do year two. Um, because now and you put in an irrigation system, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, we did. <laughs> we just got two big, big two big uh, circular sprinklers with a, that are more commercial, um, and we're condensing the footprint of everything. We're actually garden is on one side of the sprinkler, nursery on the other, and so it's ideally going to be. I'm actually going to be testing that this week. It's all going to be within the same footprint, and if it's not, I'm going to go buy another sprinkler and I'm going to get it right. I'll spend money until I get it right. Yeah, um, I mean, and sprinklers are not the end of the world, yeah. even the big ones. And that's that's something as you're setting up your homestead systems, like like I'm a frugal person. I was raised by like my grandma was a great depression survivor. And so yeah. my mom was the same way. My dad was the same way. And I started out with that mindset. And that's not how an investor should be thinking. Yes, you should be frugal, but you also need to invest your money in the right things. Like think about what your time is worth. I didn't understand because I was a musician, a musician's time is worth nothing because nobody compensates you fairly for being a musician. And so I didn't realize until I started doing homestead design and getting paid a fair wage when I suddenly could put a number on what one of my hours of time is worth. Then I started applying that to the homestead and I started saying, okay, let's say, so just you make up a number. Let's say, okay, to feed my family, realistically, let's say I need to make $40 an hour. What's, I'm going to assume that I can make that, that I'm going to build the skills that are valuable enough to make that per hourly. So now where am I spending my time where 
I shouldn't be. So in the case of watering, it only takes three wasted hours, three days before a really nice sprinkler pays for itself or maybe a week before starting, maybe it's a month of my time. And then it suddenly makes sense to put in some underground irrigation and, and step it up. So definitely as you're setting it's on, on a homestead level, but especially if you're trying to do anything for a living, think about what your time is worth and value that over money. You can go get more money. You can't get more time. Yeah. And frugality of time is important. Actually, John mm -hmm. Moody wrote a book. I think it's the frugal homestead. Mm -hmm. And part of that is staging things. So you're not wasting a bunch of time because yeah it's it's not just about like can you repurpose something exactly because yeah that's and that like when we did the book scrap steading it's it's very interesting because because billy and i wrote that book about like using scrap materials to build stuff but there's a time for that and then there's a time to switch to like okay i'm just going to lowe's and getting the big box stuff yes yeah, i'm getting the right so that's yeah. what we did for our rabbitry this year yeah and then there, there's those different seasons in your life where the different things like you'll probably find if you're on a homesteading journey but also a journey to like improve yourself you're going to part of that is you start building skills that are more valuable um and you start refining who you are and your work habits so your time gets to be worth more so like when i started out in that single wide trailer my time was worth very little i didn't have the homestead design skills i have now i didn't really know how to build much i didn't and i kind of needed to scrap stuff to get and, and i had an abundance of scrap materials on that property so these first three properties really have made sense for us to use more scrap materials and now it's starting to turn around with like with a family and everything especially and with businesses and now we have the nonprofit has become really busy our time is disappearing. So I'm learning, I have to delegate more. And sometimes delegating means I'm delegating to that guy in China that's building this prefabbed material instead of going out and scraping a log side off of a log. Now, it's all a life balance because also at the same time, we're trying to move towards, even if it's less efficient to, to, to churn my own butter, I want to churn my own butter because nobody's going to care about the quality the way I do. So you're always finding that balance and, and, and constantly tweaking it. But um, just think about both, you know, be frugal with money, but yes, be frugal with time too. Yeah. Super important. Okay. We're getting close to, to time here because mm -hmm. I actually have choir rehearsal. Speaking of an unpaid uh, musician, <laughs> <laughs> we're, it's better just to not try to get paid. It's so much. Yeah. Better. We're doing a really cool gospel, uh, show with a couple other choirs from the oh, state cool. in two fun. weeks. So well, shoot, yeah. shoot me the date. I'll see if I can make it out. Yeah. It's March 3rd. Awesome. It's a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. We always do Sunday yeah. afternoons. So that's, uh, that's coming, but, um, talk about your nursery. How do people mm -hmm. buy plants from you? Let's just go straight to it. Yep. Cause, mm -hmm. cause I uh, think that has turned out to be more of a profit center than you thought. And we should yeah. be supporting you in that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in, in part of our building bird businesses, we've had like three different farm names. So this, this will come out across as a little bit convoluted. Um, we the physical property we bought is in Centerville, Tennessee. So our physical uh, farm is Centerville Farms, and so we have a Facebook page called Centerville Farms, and so you can reach us through there. Facebook is your thing, and uh, we can do some mail order stuff for those that aren't close to us, especially like Comfrey Cuttings, Jerusalem Artichoke, which I'm an evangelist for Jerusalem Artichoke, um, and we can package up some things like our blackberry, elderberry, and, and mail them. Um, so uh, that would be through the Facebook page. If you want to, like, if you're not a Facebook person, my other website, TennesseeHomesteadDesign.com, that's got our contact information on it. And so um, I'm sorry to give you three websites. We're, we're working on connecting this. <laughs> we'll have them um, all in the show notes for you. So the, it's there, but uh, more of our nursery, our spigot kits that I was talking about and stuff like that, that's on HollowTopFarms.com. So three different websites. We're going to fix that. But um, we, we've that's all been part of the journey. Is like, let's start this. Let's start that. Um, so those are the three ways, um, but any of them work. Um, so if you Google Tennessee Homestead Design or you Google Hollow Top Farms, or you can go on Facebook and look up Centerville Farms, any of those will reach me. Um, and all of those contacts go to our to our emails and stuff. Um, but Centerville Farms has all uh, on Facebook. That's got all of our current inventory. All of Yeah, the what do you, you got? You have trees and shrubs and what mm -hmm. do you got yep, going on? Yeah, we right got uh, elderberry, pawpaw, figs, uh, everything especially really designed for the Southeast, but mostly versatile, good anywhere. Um, Papa figs, uh, thornless blackberries, several different raspberry cultivars, mostly thornless, uh, mulberry, hazelnut. Um, I'm not going to remember everything, but these are most of them. Locally, we have some big trees, big apples and pears. Those are too big to ship. Um, some uh, crab apples that are supposed to be actually quite edible and tasty, small apples. Those ones are small enough to ship. Um, we are will they have old timey crab apples. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget the exact name of them, but yeah, they're, an old... they're a cultivar that I specifically looked for that would be 
an eating apple, but also you can make pectin out of them and they mm -hmm. pollinate all the other apples. So the crab That's apple cool. is one of the most uh, neglected, forgotten staples of the homestead. It's really well, cool. they're they are cedar apple rust resistant too, yeah. aren't mm -hmm. they? So that's yeah. so I've killed an apple tree in my food forest already because of that. Yeah. And I am not replacing it with another apple. No, crab apples the way except for eating yeah. just this plain fruit, and sometimes that too, crab apples are the way to go. Yeah, they make good pies anyway, guys. Yeah, exactly. Pies yeah. are delicious. And let's be honest, Tennessee is a cooking fruit state. <laughs> There's very few fruits you can grow that are like, like take off the bush and eat without a lot of work behind it. That, that's 100% true. Awesome, guys. Well, check out Tennessee Homestead Design on Facebook. I'll drop all of Matt's links in the show notes. Thanks for being on today. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was fun. Awesome. Okay, guys, if you like the show and want to support the work I'm doing here, you can do it in two ways. One, get your coffee at hollerroast.com. Two, Consider becoming a member. Find out more at livingfreeintennessee.com. With that, go out, make it a great week.